Have you ever wondered if the medications helping millions lose weight and improve diabetes could actually secretly be harming your bones? Well, there's mixed messaging here. In, in some studies with GLP-1 drugs, a loss of 40% of the weight lost coming from lean mass. That includes bones. But other data suggests that these drugs might actually be bone conserving. So which one is it? So in this video, what I want to do is uncover some of the truth, the science behind these GLP-1 drugs like semaglutide and terzepatide. As a bone health specialist, I need to look at what do these drugs really do to bone? What does the literature say that I can pass along to my patients and you as the listeners of this channel? What can I tell you about these drugs? Because let's face it, millions of people are using them. Millions of people might be putting themselves at risk or might be preventing osteoporosis. We really need to figure out which one's true. Okay, so what are these drugs? Well, again, this is semaglutide, this is ozempic, this is terzepatide, this is Munjaro. They don't need much of an introduction because I think just about everybody knows what they are. They've taken the country by storm. Now, they do effectively lower blood sugar. They do aid in weight loss by mimicking hormones that influence hunger signals and digestion. And while dramatic weight loss and diabetes control sounds amazing, this hidden concern about their potential negative impact on bone health and lean muscle mass. Now, I got the idea to do this video because someone passed along to me this study suggesting that GLP-1s were good for bone. Now, this 2025 study shows that liraglutide, again, an older GLP-1, actually had a beneficial impact on bone, but in a mouse model. But the way that it had a good impact on bone was interesting. So it actually changed macrophages, which are part of your immune system that run around and gobble up bad things. There's different versions of macrophages, and the GLP-1 shifted them from an inflammatory version, an M1, to a beneficial or healing version, which is an M2. They also pointed out that there were other signs of reduced oxidative stress, other signs of reduced inflammation, and actually, these mice did have stronger bones after being exposed to the liraglutide. But we always have to take animal models with a grain of salt because we know that these mice weren't being fed a calorie-restrictive diet. They weren't changing the way that they eat or the way that they move because of the drugs that they were on. They were simply being exposed to the drug. While that's valuable, this might not be the same thing that we would see in real world human conditions. Now, fortunately, we have some updated data here. So there was a study, again, 2025 study, looking at a meta-analysis of 25 human clinical trials on GLP-1 receptor agonists. Now, this is primarily in a diabetic population, not necessarily for weight loss, but this is human data. So this is good news. Now, here's what they reported. They reported that there was no increase in fracture risk. And in fact, actually in these studies, they had an increase in bone density. Now, this was not an insignificant increase either, and this was compared to placebos. These, again, randomized controlled trials, GLP-1 versus not. So they also measured bone turnover markers, not particularly the ones I like, but they did measure CTX. It did go down. Other markers of bone formation actually went up. So again, oh my gosh, are these drugs actually good for bone? Could they be used in the face of osteoporosis, low bone density, or in prevention? But the thing we have to remember here is that these participants were not losing weight intentionally. They were not in a calorie deficit. So this is not the real world use that we're seeing these drugs in the weight loss space being used for. But here's my clinical experience. So we have not a lot of overweight patients because most of our patients are underweight because they have osteoporosis and sarcopenia. But of our patients that are overweight and obese, many of them are on or want to be on these GLP-1 drugs. In the past, when we would see patients who wanted to use these drugs, we would counsel them on the potential risk, our concern around the drugs. We would have them doing resistance training, of course, and we have them making sure they're getting adequate protein. Then we've had enough of these patients go through the program and have follow-up imaging, and unfortunately, we have not been happy with what we're seeing. We're seeing patients who are losing bone on GLP-1 drugs. Now, that's despite the fact that these patients, again, are doing all the things that we're recommending. They're tracking the food, they're hitting their protein targets, they're doing resistance training. I hear a lot of noise on the internet about these programs that will help you to lose weight with GLP-1s and not lose muscle which is what they talk about, but this would also be true for bone. My concern is, is that this isn't actually well studied. We don't actually know that if we're saying they do these things that you're gonna be fine. I do think that's true, but this hasn't really come to fruition in our practice. 
So let's talk about these older clinical trials. These, the STEP trials, the sustained trials, they confirmed that up to 40% of the weight being lost by people intentionally losing weight on a calorie restrictive diet are losing weight. 40% of it is coming from lean mass. And again, of course, that includes bone. So why the big disconnect here? Well, when you dose these in a weight loss perspective where you're really pushing for the impact, the effect of having reduced hunger, changes in your hunger cues, then you will see a change in how you view food, what type of food you eat. And this is why it's really important to track because what happens, we see this consistently, is that patients report that they're unable to eat adequate protein, especially from animals because of the dietary fat. Because dietary fat and animal protein is massively satiating, they get slowed down because they're, you know, their stomach's telling them, because it's amped up on GLP-1s and GIPs, it's telling them that they're full after they've consumed only a couple of ounces of meat. This is great if your goal is to lose weight, but bad if your goal is to maintain muscle mass along the way. So what happens then too, is that we see people deviate away from these animal products, from the high quality proteins. We see them deviate towards more processed foods. We see them deviate more toward carbohydrates because it's just easier to eat and it's not going to have as immediate of an impact because it's a glucose level, a blood sugar level, an insulin level, not so much the GLP-1, GIP that's going to give you that feedback. We could say in the earlier studies that I talked about that there's a reduction in inflammation, a reduction in oxidative stress, but that's not really what we're seeing here because if you're shifting away from eating high quality protein, healthy fat, and you're going to eating highly processed foods, higher in carbohydrates, this is going to be more inflammatory. It's going to have a higher oxidative load on your body. So this is why I think this is so important because what's happening in the country right now is that we have millions of people that are using these drugs and I'm not against these drugs by any means, but I think we have to be measuring bone mass. We have to be looking at density and quality and fracture risk in a population of people who are going to use these drugs. I think we probably have an epidemic, a wave of low bone density and osteoporosis as a result of using these drugs, not being able to eat adequate protein along the way, and potentially leaning on highly processed foods, adding oxidative stress and inflammation. So this is just one of many mistakes that people can make on their bone health journey, not understanding what some of these drugs can do to your diet and uh, the impact that it may have on your bone. Now, we have a masterclass where we talk about the top five mistakes that we see. Now, this is not one of them. These will be five additional mistakes that people make. My goal is to help you time collapse your journey to bone health success. My goal is to help you view bone health as a biomarker of longevity so you can live your best life. If you want to learn these five mistakes, take a look at the link in the description. Come join us for our free masterclass. All right, so what do we do then? How do we protect our bones while using GLP-1 drugs? And again, they might actually be protecting our bones but we can't say for sure, definitely based off of my clinical experience. So here are some of the things that we could consider. Number one is prioritize adequate protein intake. Make sure you're getting adequate protein. You may actually have to change your dosing of your GLP-1 drug with your doctor. You may have to change your dosing to be able to get adequate protein. You have to have the protein to maintain muscle and bone. You need to incorporate regular resistance training. If you're not using your muscles, they're not going to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. You're not going to maintain muscle mass if you're not stressing your muscles. I would also encourage you to use the lowest dose possible of your drug. I already mentioned potentially changing your dose based off of your ability to consume protein. Remember, there's this idea of microdosing out there. So people are talking about microdosing GLP ones. What does that really mean? The idea is simple. Use the lowest amount that has the desired impact. So for some people, if let's say, for example, the initial terzepatide dose is five milligrams and it goes up from there, right? So if you're using terzepatide and you're at five milligrams and you're seeing great results, maybe you don't need to titrate up. Again, of course, talk to your own doctor about this. Now, some people will even, and I do this with my patients, start at 2.5 milligrams or even 1.25 milligrams, right? So now we're taking that initial dose, we're cutting it in half or we're cutting it in half again. I've seen remarkable changes in hunger signals. I've seen remarkable changes in weight with very, very low doses of these drugs. And if we look at the, you know, the biochemistry of this, the anti-inflammatory effects, the oxidative uh, stress reduction effects, these things may also occur at very low doses. 
Now, clearly, this is off-label, and this has not been well-studied. It's worth repeating and saying that again. But the bottom line is this. If you're going to use GLP-1 receptor agonist, Ozempic, Munjaro, Terzepatite, if you're going to use these drugs, make sure that you are looking at your bone. This includes imaging studies. Know what your starting point is. I would encourage you to use bone turnover markers along the way to make sure that you're not getting too catabolic, you're not losing too much bone. I would recommend doing both a REMS and a DEXA, looking at REMS so that we understand what our density as well as our quality is, understand what our fracture risk is. And then if you're losing too much lean mass, you're losing too much muscle, then I would strongly encourage you to reconsider how you're using your GLP-1 drugs. And this is just a great example of why we need to be looking at bone health as a biomarker of health span, a biomarker of longevity. If you're losing bone, something is wrong. Now, we know that getting rid of excess weight is going to be helpful from a health span perspective. So I'm always looking at this through the lens of longevity and aging. And if you have extra weight, we need to get that off. Extra visceral fat, absolutely we need to get that off. But we can't do it at the expense of our muscle and bone. That's why when I talk about longevity protocols, we're talking about aging with strength and with grace. That means maintaining your muscle mass, maintaining your bone, and looking at all of your other biomarkers and adjusting accordingly. That's it. Thanks so much for your time here. Remember that a diagnosis of osteoporosis isn't the end, but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I'll see you in the next video.